Um, so welcome to this session of Raising Peace. Uh, this, uh, the Raising Peace event is held in a lead up to the United Nations Day of Peace on the 21st of September. My name is Lee Schuringer and I am part of the Raising Peace Network. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where each of us, us, where each of us is today. I acknowledge their elders and their care for the land. The Raising Peace Network is an alliance of more than 30 organizations that together are working to share ideas, knowledge and inspiration for a peaceful world. To learn more about what the network is about, go to our website, raisingpeace.org.au. This session is recorded and will be placed on our website in the next weeks. Our Zoom tech host is Brooke, who is called Raising Peace, and hopefully we won't have any Zoom problems tonight. Please mute yourself. Uh, you can place questions and comments for the speakers in the chat. Please do not engage in a debate in the chat. At this session, we will have two speakers from ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, and it's a big topic. The speakers are Professor Tillman Ruff, who's an infectious diseases and public health expert who has focused his efforts on the prohibition of nuclear weapons for decades. He is one of the co-founders of ICANN. And Jamila Rushton, who is the acting director for ICANN Australia. We will put this information in the chat, as well as the title of the session, as it's a lot to take in. And I'll read out what the session is about. And hopefully by the end of the session, you will be clearer about what all of this is. The title of the session is The Next Steps Towards the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. The Labour Party agreed to sign the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons while in opposition. What is ICANN doing? And what can we do to make this happen? As well, Australian ICANN delegates were at recent global conferences in Vienna in June about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and in New York in August at the UN conference on the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. They were different conferences with different outcomes. And what will be good to know is what's next and how can we be part of that? So I now, Tillman will speak first and then Jamala, Jamila, and then we will have time for questions. So um, yeah, put your questions and comments in the, uh, in the chat and then we'll see how we can address them. Tillman, over to you. So thanks very much, uh, Visa. I hope you can hear me and uh, I'll share my, my screen. So I hope you're able to, to see that. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. great. Okay. So I'm going to leave Jamila to largely talk about the treaty um, and where that's happening. She was recently at the first meeting of states parties in Vienna. Um, I really want to set the scene with what's happening with nuclear weapons, who's got them, where they are, what are the current dangers, essentially to remind you of just how dire our situation is and really unfortunately not much else related to nuclear weapons is going well apart from the treaty which really adds to its urgency and to our our support um, and promotion of it um, i'll say a little about the npt revcon um, because there's unfortunately not all that much um, to say but i wanted to start with um as soon as I can get this to work, um, to just highlight how much for everybody that kind of hoped or wished that nuclear weapons had gone away and that danger was something we didn't have to worry about anymore, the Russian invasion of Ukraine really should have put paid to that. This is ongoing situation of extraordinary brutality um, and inhumanity, which also raises very profound uh, nuclear dangers, not just in the repeated threats uh, to use nuclear weapons that the Russians have made, 
but also in holding hostage the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, uh, essentially as a potentially massive radiological um, weapon. The countries that are involved in NATO and Russia between them have most of the world's nuclear weapons, about 95% of them, and all of the 2000 odd nuclear weapons that are on high alert, ready to be launched within a few minutes of a decision um, to do so. And all of those nations, the nuclear armed nations of NATO, um, France and the UK with their own, and the US and Russia have policies to use nuclear weapons first in a conflict. Um, why won't this go forward? So President Putin has made really explicit uh, nuclear threats. Uh, it's clear that the nuclear saber rattling that they have embarked upon, uh, explicit, repeated, um, is really provides cover for the brutality of this invasion. As um, former President Medvedev has very clearly said, uh, basically, nuclear weapons give us impunity. Don't try and hold us to account. Um, while the Russians have been the most blatant with this playbook recently, uh, you know, this is an old playbook that all of the nuclear armed states are engaged in. This is a, a quote from Ad Admiral Charles Richard, um, head of uh, US Strategic Command, who last year very explicitly wrote just about not only about the very real possibility of nuclear weapons being used, but that the foundational nature of strategic nuclear forces is creating man maneuver space uh, for us to project conventional military power strategically. This is exactly what the Russians are also doing. This is a game that all of the nine nuclear armed states are playing. But these weapons are not some divine or magical creation or force of nature. They are machines uh, that were built by human beings and can be dismantled uh, by human beings. Currently, there are still close to 13,000 nuclear weapons, 90% uh, of them Russian or American, almost 4,000 deployed, more than half of those on high alert, uh, Russia, um, UK, US and France. Their average size is about 11 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. And for the first time since the end of the Cold War, the number of deployed militarily usable weapons is again increasing. And there are still multi megaton range weapons deployed. The most important new science uh, that underpins our understanding of just how catastrophic any use of nuclear weapons would be, I'd like to update for you because I think it's, it's really essential information for an informed uh, modern citizen. And, and it really underpins why these should not be regarded um, as weapons in any meaningful usable sense. These are, these are suicide bombs. And that evidence relates to their climate impacts, um, which, and so I'll let me just update this, um, this work for you. So nuclear weapons are uh, uh, unique, not just in their size, in the radiation that they release, uh, in the electromagnetic pulse that they can cause, and a number of other features, but they are extremely efficient at igniting um, over very large areas, essentially everything flammable that will burn. So even the relatively small by today's standards, tactical sized nuclear weapon uh, used in Hiroshima released about a thousand times as much energy in the fires that it started as the explosive power of the weapon itself. The petroleum products, plastics, gas, oil, um, wood, paper, cloth, textiles, everything that will burn in cities releases uh, dense sooty smoke. In Hiroshima, about 13 square kilometers of the city comprehensively burned. A, a modern multi-megaton weapon would ignite and essentially comprehensively burn about 1600 square kilometers. So you can understand why so much smoke would be produced, millions of tons of smoke um, that would be injected high into the atmosphere. The scenario that's been most widely studied simply as one of the most plausible, uh, there's nothing unique about this, it would be a war between India and Pakistan. It's a clearly a realistic prospect. Um, and this um, scenario uses about half of the arsenals that they're estimated to have 
uh, in 2025 of varying size. So Hiroshima size, a bit bigger or 100 kilotons. This is less than 2% of the global nuclear arsenal. And because these are relatively smaller, less than 1% of its total explosive yield. These would put somewhere between 15 and 40 million tonnes of black carbon into the atmosphere, cause horrendous um, casualties in South Asia. But it's really their climate impacts that I want to speak to. Um, smoke generated in South Asian cities that would burn would spread pretty quickly over most of the inhabited regions of the planet uh, within about 10 or 14 days. If you take a cross section through the atmosphere, so this is going up on the vertical scale, and this is the South Pole on the left and the North Pole on the right, uh, that's where the smoke is injected over India and Pakistan. Um, then you can see really quickly within a couple of days, um, this smoke is essentially all in the upper atmosphere where there's no rain, no weather, it doesn't wash out, it stays for a very long time. In fact, over a decade, cooling, darkening and drying the surface of the earth beneath. Um, so just to walk you through some complicated um, data in a simple way, this is the decline in precipitation. So rainfall on the left, temperature on the right for various sizes of um, how much smoke is put into the atmosphere. So the green one is a Russian-US nuclear war. The others are India-Pakistan scenarios involving different numbers and sizes of weapons. Let's just focus on the 50 kiloton weapons in this black line. This purple bar is the range of how much colder it was at the height of the last ice age 20,000 years ago than now. And it was between three and eight degrees colder than present. And you can see that most of these scenarios get us down into ice age temperatures, but these would not come on over centuries. These would come on essentially within a matter of days, um, lasting for several years. So ice age conditions essentially overnight not evenly distributed, much colder, more than 10 or 15 degrees colder in the large land masses where most of the world's people live and most of the world's food, food is grown. We're currently not very good at looking after the people, feeding the people we already have. Um, COVID has drastically increased the number of people who are hungry today to over 800 million people. Um, and about a third of humanity, about two and a half billion people are at least moderately food insecure. Again, this number is increasing dramatically uh, with climate change, COVID and um, the subsequent economic uh, difficulties. So colder, darker, dry, you can imagine is not terrific for food production. And this is without taking into account other factors that are difficult to model um, but which would also have profound effects, a loss of ozone that protects us from ultraviolet radiation, radioactive contamination, and disruption to all of the complex inputs, the movement and use of seed, fertilizer, fuel, transport, storage that, that underpin food production and its distribution um, globally. So just colder, darker, drier, what does that do um, to food production? Well, it reduces the net primary productivity of the planet. So what plants produce by that's available for either food or fiber by about as much as humans use in total at present. Um, it's, it's not a trivial decrease. This is the most recent work published um, just last month in Nature Food by a, a large international scientific collaboration. And you can see for different scenarios for an India-Pakistan nuclear war, um, that's these first four bars, you can see somewhere between hundreds of millions and upwards of two billion people at the end of year two, uh, basically starving to death. Um, and with um, an India, uh, sorry, a Russian US nuclear war essentially starving most of the planet by the end of, of year two. Um, so really, really, th this would be by far the largest um, effect uh, in terms of um, on people of, of nuclear war, as bad as the other effects would be. And you can see that, again, the effects are not evenly distributed. This is just a, a smallish India-Pakistan war for maize. 
and you can see these dark declines are more than 60% decline. You can see that most of the nuclear armed states, in fact, um, Canada, US, most of Europe, Russia, China, Korea, um, drastic declines in food production um, from a limited regional nuclear war, even in another planetary region. And this is the proportion. Let's look at the top one for a middling scenario for an India-Pakistan war. You can see that we're talking about essentially more than three quarters of the population um, starving in Canada and Russia and most of Northern Europe, more than half the population being starving at the end of year two, and that's not the end of things in China, uh, over a billion people. So, and these are conservative estimates. Uh, these don't take into account a whole lot of factors. And these studies were done when the population, using numbers when the population was significantly um, smaller. So it highlights just how urgent it is that these weapons be eliminated before they're used again. Um, so where are we with disarmament? Unfortunately, not in a great place. Uh, nobody's disarming. Treaties, hard won treaties that were the fruits of the end of the first Cold War are being shredded. Um, there are no disarmament negotiations underway. All of the nuclear armed states are investing very serious amounts of money in not just keeping weapons they already have, but adding new capacities, new weapons types that we haven't seen before, particularly more accurate, more flexible, um, more usable, all tending to reduce the threshold for their possible um, possible use. And there are a couple of additional ways that nuclear war might start um, that are also escalating. So the, the most authoritative and best known assessment of how we're tracking against the big trends on an annual basis is the doomsday clock. It stands from last year and this year as far forward as it has ever been. Um, and Antonio Guterres, the world's most senior diplomat, been using really blunt language about this danger and, and he's made um, even stronger statements recently. Um, two of the threats that really worry me, apart from the, the acute threat of the Russian war, is, is the growing number in pink over the last 10 years of internationalised conflicts within one state, but involving a state outside. Um, disproportionately those involved states are the nuclear armed states. Um, this is, I think, the reality of climate change really starting to bite on food and water security and population movement. Um, each of these poses some risk of, of escalation. And of course, cyber warfare, which is really difficult to control and tens of states um, are very actively involved in now. We know that nuclear command and control systems are vulnerable because those who've managed them have told us that. And we've seen um, multiple hacks of systems that control nuclear weapons, the whole of the US National Nuclear Security Administration, which manages the, the nuclear weapons stockpile in the US was extensively hacked at the end of 2020. Um, and of course, we know too, because those who've managed nuclear weapons tell us that if nuclear war starts, the risk of escalation is to, to all out nuclear war is extremely high. Um, so all is not well. So you would hope that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, which had been postponed about two years because of COVID that happened during the month of August might take this wake up call and get serious about disarmament. Well, unfortunately, nothing much came out of that. The, um, this, unfortunately, this conference operates by consensus, which essentially means that the nuclear armed states can get away with lowest common denominator. And it's very difficult to, to reach agreement. On this occasion, Russia rejected the final outcome document because of wording related to, to their Ukraine war. But in fact, in the negotiation of the final document that, that the Russians in the end rejected, none of the nuclear armed states that are members of the treaty um, were willing to countenance any significant new disarmament measures, anything that mentioned a timeline, um, targets or a date uh, was countenanced. So some of the, the serious um, and insightful commentary about this really highlights that, um, you know, the nuclear armed states still um, show no serious intention to, to disarm.
um, and the gap between the the rest of the world frustrated about this continuing failure and the growing danger um, and the nuclear armed states clinging to their self-appointed right to to possess um, weapons that pose an existential threat to everybody remains and is stark and in fact is growing. Um, we have had some welcome developments with the new government that Jamila will talk a bit more about, but there sh we should have no sense of complacency that change is automatic or large when governments change. And unfortunately, uh, largely driven by officials, um, so bureaucrats rather than elected officials, um, we haven't seen at the NPT Revcon much of, of encouragement. Australia defended its nuclear acquired submarine plan, nuclear propelled submarine plan. It didn't join a humanitarian statement that we had hoped it would. Um, it didn't support uh, any reference to uh, nuclear allied states also having a responsibility to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in their security policies. Um, so we still have, have serious work to do. So that makes the treaty, I'm going to skip that one because Jamila is going to talk about the treaty, but just that makes the treaty the one bright spot in this landscape uh, even more important. Um, it's gradually accruing more and more states. So currently 86 signatures, 66 uh, ratifications, another one due uh, on Wednesday. That's why I put 67. Um, in all of the UN votes uh, that got us the treaty and since, there have been over 120 states that voted in favour, so more than two thirds of the world's governments. So we would hope that the number of states that join the treaty will continue to grow steadily, uh, hopefully to upwards of 100 before too long. So I'll finish there and hand over to, to Jamila and stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thanks. I wonder if Jamila is going to cover some of the questions in the chat. Who in Australia and the Pacific are trained to disarm nuclear weapons? And what's the protocol? That's a big question. It's, but the yeah. ALP, so but the ALP statement, uh, will you be addressing that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Jamila, go for it. Great. Thanks, Tillman. Um, Yes, I'll just gather my thoughts here. I don't have any um, have anything to share on my screen, so apologies. Um, so yeah, to follow on from that, I will talk a little bit about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I'll also talk about um, my experience in Vienna at the first meeting of states parties to this treaty, which happened in June, early, yeah, earlier this year. Uh, incredible, incredible place to be. And then I'll probably finish up just with a few more if I can answer any questions that are in the chat. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's happening now. Um, so thanks everyone and Luis for inviting us and um, for being able to be participating in this wonderful session. And great to see some familiar faces on the screen as well as some, some people that I don't know. It's really, really wonderful. So um, wonderful to see everyone. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the treaty. Tillman mentioned that um, we're currently sitting at 86 signatories and 66 um, states or member parties. Um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, as Tillman mentioned, um, was adopted by um, over 120 nations and then um, entered into force in January 2021. Um, so that happened when it reached uh, the uh, pivotal number of 50 um, ratifications um, and then entered into force, making it permanent international law 90 days after that. So that happened in January 2021. Um, and the first meeting of the states parties was due to happen uh, much sooner, but obviously due with, to pandemic and, and cancellations, it was held in June this year. Um, and that was actually the first time that many of these states had met in person to discuss the treaty and how they are implementing it um, since, since the entry into force. So very exciting time and long awaited and, and much anticipated. Um, there was a successful campaign for Australia to attend as an observer state. So um, as we haven't uh, signed the treaty, we, we can't participate in a voting capacity, but we were able to um, participate as a, an observer, which is phenomenal. And I'm sure that um, many people here were involved 
there's I can see a few people here that were definitely involved in making that happen. So thanks to everyone that really um, got behind that campaign and was reaching out to their MPs because it really did make a difference, especially with a very quick turnaround of government. It's um, really phenomenal that Australia was able to send an observer delegation um, and that was headed by Susan Templeman MP um, and members of DFAT were there as well. Um, and yeah, while she was there, um, the Australian delegation had met with a great many people, including the chair of the conference, Pacific leaders, parliamentarians from other observer states in attendance and a whole bunch of other people from civil society. So incredible achievement to have that. And I think a really positive step um, away from a previous government who had boycotted negotiations of the treaty, wasn't participating at all, to then shift into this place of um, engaging, listening and learning about yeah, I guess a lot of making up for lost time, uh, I think. So that was really wonderful to see. Um, and it was also the first time that a great number of uh, umbrella states and NATO states and states that host nuclear weapons engaged with these discussions. So um, states like Belgium, Finland, Sweden, Netherlands, um, Norway and Germany, other European countries, um, were also observing and many of those also participated um, very um, positively and, and expressed an openness to learning and engaging with the treaty. So, and this is also things we hadn't seen before. So very encouraging. And also I think good to remember that Australia observing makes a difference. So when we see these countries starting to participate, the, it, it, it sets a really great example. So yeah, I think it's um, makes, <laughs> Yeah, it's very positive to see people engaging and that, you know, the work is being done to take this treaty seriously, which is what the member states have been treating it seriously all along. So, um, and it did definitely have that feeling at, at the meeting. It was only three days long, so there was a lot of work to do, but the sense was really in the room of no messing around. We're getting down to business. We are figuring out how to implement this treaty and coming up with some positive steps around, um, yeah, advancing it so that is it was very very positive in that stage so there was um, momentum with four new ratifications confirmed um, over the course of the conference so from Malawi, Timor-Leste, Cabo Verde and Grenada um, and also eight countries also announced that they're in the process of ratifying the treaty which is also really exciting so um, countries like Brazil, Democratic Republic of Congo, the Dominican Republic, Ghana, Indonesia, Mozambique, Nepal and Niger um, so, yeah, some countries in our region also um, moving at pace. Many in our region, of course, have already signed and ratified this treaty. We are in Australia um, quickly becoming, um, yeah, isolated in the fact that we have not yet signed or ratified. Um, but very positive to see that more countries in our region are also getting on board and furthering that progress. Um, trying to think of other things. There are a lot of other firsts around this conference. So um, there was a parliamentary forum as part of the civil society events ahead of the, ahead of the MSP, um, where parliamentarians from different countries, some member states, some not member states, were um, getting together to talk about the treaty. And there was a really strong statement from that forum that was delivered um, to the meeting of states parties. Similarly, there was a really strong youth um, representation and youth statement delivered. So really broadening out the movement to include new and different voices in, in the debate, um, especially yet yeah, during the meeting itself. Um, perhaps one of the, yeah, the most important thing really to come out of it was the Vienna Declaration and the Vienna Action Plan. So two very strong documents that came out of um, the three day negotiation yeah, talks, negotiations. Um, so the declaration, um, I'll put a link in as well with, with some of this if, if Tillman doesn't already, but um, really kind of such a strong statement from member states coming out around the strength of the treaty, the importance, the urgency, um, and yeah, just incredibly strong language and really setting that this is the new benchmark of international security while still reaffirming the complementarity between the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the NPT and other disarmament architecture. Um, so that's very important. Um, and the 50 point action plan that was adopted um, by all member states is also incredibly um, heartening, um, seeing them come together and setting out a really solid plan for how to implement this treaty. Um, so there's a 
I can send a link for that as well. Um, and within the action plan, there are a series of uh, working groups that have been set up and established. Um, yep, Tillman's putting that in the chat, great. Um, which are, yeah, which will meet quarterly between um, now and the next meeting of states parties in November, 2023, um, to discuss things like verifications, victim assistance and environmental remediation and the international cooperation around that. Um, and also the sort of um, development of com competent authorities that would eventually oversee um, how nuclear weapons states would disarm once joining the treaty. So it's visionary, it's forward thinking, um, and with an understanding that there, there's conversations that need to start now um, for this to, to happen. So there's also going to be a scientific advisory group as part of the intercessionals process as well, um, which, yeah, is really exciting to see other voices being brought in and, and having, yeah, having an opportunity to contribute to the ongoing conversations. Um, so this was also a really amazing time in Vienna because it was the first time that many campaigners and organisers were able to gather in person too. So it was incredibly um, inspiring to meet many hundreds of people focused on this work from all over the world. Uh, the, the presence of civil society from the start to the finish was very strong and the voices of civil society were, um, yeah, there were many spaces for those to be uh, heard and, and amplified, which is incredible. Um, ICANN International hosted a civil society forum in the lead up to the first meeting of states parties. So as part of the nuclear ban week, um, which had two days of a huge selection of um, talks and forums and discussions from, from folks who have been involved all over the world. So people were talking about gender, um, divestment, they were, we were hearing stories from um, survivors, we were hearing survivor focused approaches to addressing the legacy of nuclear harm and nuclear testing, um, a huge amount of voices and, and yeah, many regional voices from across the world. And um, yeah, many of those can still be watched back online. So that's an incredible, um, they've kept, just captured so much of the voices of civil society there too. And I can put that um, in the chat too. Um, and here in Australia, um, we also produced a detailed brief of each day between the Civil Society Forum, the Humanitarian Impact Statement and the MSP. Um, so those were on our website and I'll put those in there as well, um, which are really great if you want like a digest of what happened um, over the course of that week. Um, and of course, we had four hub events here in Australia that um, I was able to zoom into connecting Vienna <laughs> to um, three different capital cities in Australia. So yeah, that was a really amazing level of participation. And thanks to everyone here who made those hubs so phenomenal. It was really um, overseas. It was very, very well um, received and people in Vienna were amazed at how engaged and supportive and, and really involved that um, supporters and people are in Australia with the campaign. So really excellent to see that. And um, perhaps the most special of those was the hub that we had in Port Augusta. Um, so there was a Port Augusta hub event, which was hosted by um, communities impacted by nuclear weapons testing. So there was um, an event which kind of brought a whole bunch of families and communities together um, to discuss those impacts, which was followed by a panel discussion, which was then broadcast um, to the room in Vienna, um, headed by, facilitated by Karina Lester and also featured Auntie Sue Coleman Hasseldine and Mia Hasseldine, who's Auntie Sue's granddaughter. Um, and they, yeah, their um, statement and their forum was phenomenal and so well received and very powerful. And um, Following that, the city of Port Augusta also um, joined the ICANN Cities Appeal. So a really, really powerful moment and, um, yeah, a really incredible way to link the um, communities on the front line to the communities in the negotiating rooms and also contribute to activism um, and, you know, more advocacy here in Australia towards Australia joining. So really, really phenomenal time. And I guess that's possibly, that's probably it that I can say about the MSP. There's 
perhaps more that can come out in the questions and discussion. Um, but just to reiterate where we are now, so as Tillman mentioned, we have um, a government with a commitment to sign and ratify the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons um, and a Prime Minister who is a band champion. Um, um, yes, Albanese is a supporter of the treaty and um, was integral in um, yeah, moving the motion to secure the party's commitment to this. So um, this is really great for us. Um, we also have 102 members of the federal parliament who have signed the parliamentary pledge, um, including a majority of the federal Labor Party, many of the Teals and the independents and other important members of the crossbench. So um, that's also really encouraging. Um, and we also have a new parliamentary friends group, which has reconvened in this new parliament and had its first meeting last week, um, even despite uh, the changes in the parliamentary sitting schedule, the parliamentary friends of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons still met, which is very exciting. Um, and those numbers continue to grow as well in membership. So we have a lot of um, positive things on our side. I think what we actually need now is to activate all of those politicians to really um, see through this commitment and, and put put in place the policy that this, this parliament has to sign and ratify the treaty. So it's it's very different. They're not in opposition anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a government and now they're, it's like our job and their job to implement this treaty. But I think there is still a huge role for civil society advocacy to make sure that our MPs are across this and know um, what's at stake. Um, you know, the, the information that Tillman shared with us is very real and very current and, um, you know, we are the people who can um, let them know about this and, and continue to keep the pressure on um, for continued advocacy as we move towards Australia's signature and ratification. Um, so there's a growing community of nuclear ban advocates who are all over Australia who are lobbying at all levels of government to um, support the treaty and raise awareness about it in their communities. So that could be local councils with cities of heal and or talking to your state member or talk, talking to your federal member. They, they're all so important to, to keep um, the pressure on and keep building momentum for the treaty. So um, I will, yeah, I'll put a link to advocates and we have a little online meeting every six weeks or so of people that are involved in that work where we um, can give you a more in-depth briefing about what's happening and key moments that are, um, yes, key moments that are coming up and good opportunities to meet with your MP, things to let them know about. So um, that's a really great way if people are wanting to get more involved and really help us to see this one through, um, this is the, a really amazing way to do it. Um, and I'll just maybe finish by flagging two of those dates that are coming up. Um, so the 26th of September is the International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. And the October the 3rd is the 70th anniversary of the beginning of nuclear weapons testing here in Australia. So these are two um, opportunities that we can uh, make known to our parliamentary representatives. We can, um, yeah, encourage them to meet with us or um, maybe even to talk about these events on their own social media platforms like this is excellent ways to engage with them and keep this issue front of mind. So I probably finished with that because I know that there is um, a few questions mm -hmm. in the chat, but maybe if um, it's quite a lot of, I haven't been able to keep up with all the threads. So maybe if we and others have some um, moderated questions, that'd be really great. So thanks for your attention, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, what can each of us do to put pressure on the government, because I think that the AUKUS agreement, uh, they've boxed themselves in a bit, because if we're going ahead with the nuclear powered submarines, what does that mean in signing the treaty to abolish nuclear weapons? What, how, how does that sit? Tillman, would you like to take that one? Sure. Well, in a sense, formally, they're, they're strictly speaking, they're, they're different issues. The submarines are nuclear propelled uh, and not to be nuclear armed. Um, but yeah, 
there's more one could say about that. Um, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons um, is very specifically focused on nuclear weapons. It doesn't address nuclear power or it repeats the same language as the NPT does. Essentially, that's basically what all that was possible to achieve. Um, uh, and it doesn't say anything about naval nuclear propulsion. So um, there are profound concerns that, that ICANN and many people and many organisations have about Australia sort of blowing safeguards out of the water in a way. Uh, being the first nation potentially to exploit a loophole in the International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards agreements to take material that would normally be under strict safeguards uh, essentially out of them, um, very large amounts of it, about 20 to 25 nuclear weapons worth per submarine, um, out of safeguards, you know, on a stealth mobile platform for years at a time, um, is not exactly going to do the international non-proliferation regime much good, especially when that material is very likely to be highly enriched uranium, 97.3% U-235, directly weapons usable. Um, so that's a serious concern, and, and there are many others in terms of this essentially being uh, about confronting China and about drawing Australia in uh, to uh, like any likely conflict between the US and and, um, and China and upping the stakes uh, in, enormously there, ratcheting up a very unwelcome um, arms race. However, if Australia, so, so for lots of reasons, we have argued very strongly and will continue to do so that, that the submarines um, shouldn't be proceeded with, um, and that Australia, that the new government should not feel bound by a late, uh, you know, decision by the Dutton Morrison government. That's by an order of magnitude the largest defence expenditure that Australia has ever embarked upon, which will take decades to implement and has implications for our region, for our for our relationships, um, for our security that are probably greater than any previous Australian military uh, acquisition. Uh, Labor gave very clear caveats for, you know, in the less than 24 hours it was given to uh, notice for the public announcement of this, um, which are that this is not a path to establishing a domestic nuclear industry in Australia. This is not about Australia acquiring nuclear weapons. Um, and this must be entirely consistent with our non-proliferation obligations under the non-proliferation treaty. And on that last point, um, there were many nations that have raised very serious concerns about those <clears throat> non-proliferation implications at the review conference. Pacific nations like Kiribati, uh, Indonesia very strongly and Malaysia, Peru, South Africa, uh, Russia, China, um, and China has, has just in the last few days raised probably the strongest challenge ever that I can remember um, to the AUKUS acquisition of nuclear powered submarines uh, through the International Atomic Energy Agency. So Labor would have ample grounds uh, in this period where, of planning when no firm decisions have been made um, to, to, let, to revisit this decision and, and, and let it quietly go. Um, so I really think they need to hear from us on that. But if Labor does um, persist with that, with the plan, then we would argue that it makes it even more imperative that Australia join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, because by far the most convincing uh, way and the strongest way that Australia could uh, make it clear that this is not about the thin end of the wedge for Australia acquiring nuclear weapons or stationing nuclear weapons in Australia uh, would be to join the ban treaty. Um, there are questions in the chat about Penny Wong uh, speaking at the UN. What is all of that about? Uh, in, in Leaders Week, so the first week of, of the General Assembly meets every year from September to December. Um, and the first week, uh, 
which happens to be next week this year, uh, is so-called Leaders Week when essentially the big and the powerful and the great and the good uh, supposedly come and uh, drop pearls of their wisdom for the global community. Um, you know, presidents, prime ministers uh, or foreign ministers come and strut their stuff and then go home while the diplomats, uh, you know, do the work over the next few months of considering all the many issues before the General Assembly. So um, it would be certainly a very fitting uh, opportunity for the Prime Minister to, to make a major speech and signal that Australia is under new management and blow the winds of change through some important areas of policy. Um, but it, we understand that, that, that the speech from Australia um, is being delivered by by Penny Wong on Saturday, this coming Saturday afternoon, New York time. So probably Sunday morning, our time. Um, we don't know what's in it. We've certainly urged her very strongly to um, include positive reference um, to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, uh, welcome its entry into force and, and affirm its complementarity uh, with the non-proliferation treaty, um, but we don't know yet what what she'll say. But it's certainly not too late um, to communicate with her office to ask MPs um, to urge uh, such positive mention of the treaty, and uh, and also for it's a it would be a really important opportunity for the Labor government to signal um, a change of direction by changing its vote on a couple of key. UN resolutions, particularly the vote for the treaty, um, which will come up. And Australia has always voted no in the past to this resolution that acknowledges and welcomes the treaty, urges governments to join it. Um, it would be really important for Australia to send a positive signal by changing its vote from no, preferably to yes. Uh, and that vote won't happen until after the 28th of October. Um, so there's more time, there's a whole nother month um, for the government, um, foreign affairs, uh, people in Canberra, Penny, to hear um, of the importance of Australia changing its vote, particularly on that resolution. So all of us could be sending emails and tagging Penny Wong and Albanese on our uh, Twitter accounts. Absolutely. About Absolutely. Yes, please. Yes, and I put a link um, in the chat as well to um, sign up as a nuclear weapons ban advocate and um, we will be talking about this, particularly the yes, hopefully yes vote and our hopes that it will be, yeah, turn a no from a yes um, at that first committee vote it, about that. We'll be talking about that at the next ban advocate meetup. So if people want to come and have a deep dive into the sort of, um, yeah, those details, then please, please feel free to join us because, yeah, we love to talk shop and, um yeah, get more people across this, these details. So absolutely would encourage people writing as well. I've put um, Senator Wong's email address in the chat as well. Mm. Yeah. And with these special dates coming up, are there events or online events that people can join uh, on the 26th of September and the 3rd of October? Um, not that we are running as yet. Um, I'm not entirely sure if there, we will do something on the third as yet. We haven't locked in anything, but I'm sure there will be people on this call who are organising things around the 26th. And there's also the, obviously the one that's in a few days is the International Day of Peace, which is another really important yeah. one, which is obviously a lot of organising has gone into to that. So um, yeah, there'll be many opportunities, but certainly we'll be marking them in some way and uh, yeah, stay, stay tuned for more info. Yeah. And I saw a little question back in the chat around the um, intersessional working groups. So apologies, I think I raced through that bit a little bit, um, but those working groups are for um, members, member states of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So um, those who have ratified um, and those working groups are headed by different member states as well. Uh, the Red Cross and um, ICANN are the, the two main civil society partners. So we'll have an opportunity to uh, participate in some way in some of those working groups. But 
they're not open to other signature states really or, or non-member states or general public. But um, we are hoping that we can um, find a way to continue to share the information between um, what, what learnings come from that those sessions because they will be very important with the Australian government and, the, and those who are kind of heading up the decision-making capacities. Mm. Yep. There was a question in the chat about who in Australia and the Pacific are trained to disarm nuclear weapons and what is the protocol for dealing with the components, especially the fuel? But I think it's a whole different question. Yeah, I won't say too much. I did make a brief comment in the yeah. chat. Um, I mean, essentially, nuclear armed states know how to do this. You know, they've, they've historically dismantled 1,500 nuclear weapons between them per annum. So if they kept going at that rate, you know, they could get rid of all of the weapons that still exist in less than a decade. Um, dismantling the, the weapons, you know, does involve um, some nasty materials that need to be kept very secure, uh, particularly the plutonium for which there's no really good purpose other than keeping it under the most stringent uh, levels of security for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, it's a very small volume, but the level of security that it demands will be profound. Um, highly enriched uranium um, can has a more, a, a larger range of uses. Um, for quite a significant period of time uh, around um, starting around 20 years ago, uh, about half the nuclear power that was generated in the United States for roughly a decade came from old Russian warheads uh, where the highly enriched uranium was down blended to reactor grade and used in power reactors. Um, obviously still ends up with accident risks and nuclear waste, but it's better than having it sitting in weapons. So there are other possible uses for highly enriched uranium, um, but those fissile materials obviously need to be kept secure uh, from the environment and from people and, and from potentially being reused in weapons. The rest of the components are, are, are really, um, you know, small quantities that can, be, that can be fairly readily managed. It's a much smaller problem um, than you know, having the weapons um, in danger of use, and uh, the nuclear armed states have extensive experience at dismantling them um, already. Yeah, so it's an engineering and scientific process, but that's all that it's all very doable. Yeah. And Gray is asking a question. Gray in New Zealand, how important are diplomatic uh, relations? It seems there is an increased polarization in the Pacific. Um, yeah, to the diplomatic relationships to abolish nuclear weapons and the involvement of the Pacific. Is there any comment? Well, I would that? just comment that, I mean, Australia is a member of the Pacific Islands Forum and there's obviously now quite active process. You know, everybody wants to be a friend of the Pacific for kind mm. of strategic reasons nowadays, given that it's become a more intense arena for for great power influence. Um, the Pacific people and leaders have been telling us for, for many years to anybody who'll listen that their most urgent priority is dealing with climate change, mm. with global heating. Um, and they remain profoundly concerned about the legacy of more than 300 nuclear tests inflicted upon them. Um, and they have been amongst the strongest supporters of global nuclear disarmament. 10 of the 50 states uh, that had ratified the treaty when it, to get it into force were Pacific Island states. And all of those that don't have um, either colonial legacy relationships with France or the US or um, that, that have the capacity to, to act independently on foreign and, and military matters are strongly supportive of the treaty. So I think from, from a civil society perspective, um, you know, polarization, if it's for the right reasons, um, you know, it may be perfectly appropriate. Um, and it's time if Australia is serious about its specific step up, um, as it claims to be, that not only does it get serious about about climate action, but it also gets serious about disarmament action and dealing with the 
the ongoing needs for nuclear justice from the terrible legacy of mm -hmm. nuclear testing in the region. Mm -hmm. We're coming to the end of our session. Jamila, would you have a final comment? Um, no, I think just grateful that everyone um, was here and, and took the time to come and hear about this issue. I know that sometimes these things can feel quite far from our daily lives, but just so um, wonderful and encouraging to see so many of you on this call and committed to learning about and, and taking action on this issue and hope to see hope to see you soon. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you both for contributing. Uh, it can, you know, although I have picked through your website many a time, I still feel it all quite overwhelming at times. Uh, and I know I'll never know, you know, a percent of what both of you know, uh, but that should not hold us back in writing to Penny Wong, to Albanese, to our local member of parliament, and also to our senators in our state. Um, and say, go to this website. These people know what they're talking about. I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer. I don't know all these things, but uh, do what you can. And uh, yeah, Jamila and both, and Tillman, you've put a lot in the chat. Um, and so I think I'll encourage all of you to make a nice pot of tea or have a nice glass of wine and just sit there and pick through it. And hopefully you'll retain some of it and talk to your friends and your neighbors and say, this is actually real. And, um, and we can do something about this. It's not the end, uh, you know, yes, it's massive. And it was very disappointing that, um, that a conference in August at the UN uh, did not, not have any greater results, but that just means we need to keep going. Uh, we can't just say, well, it didn't work, so therefore let's stop working on these methods. So thank you both very much for your contribution. As I said before, the session is recorded and it will in a few weeks time be on our website. Uh, and then you can also refer people to that. And from uh, ICANN as well, you can link Put the link in uh, uh, on the uh, ICANN website, um, and that will, yeah, we'll keep going. There's no way any of us can stop uh, on this important matter of all our security. Recently, I reread the book by Neville Shute uh, on the beach, and although it was written in the 50s, it still grabbed me the way it did 50, or well, about 30 years ago when I first read it or 40 years ago when I first read it. And I'm sure part of my migration to Australia is it might be safer in Australia than in the Netherlands. Yeah. So thank you all again. And uh, there are another four, five sessions in the Raising Peace event. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we'll invite you to join other sessions. We'll just leave it, the chat open a little bit longer uh, so that if there's anything you want to copy out of it, um, then uh, you can do so. So otherwise, goodbye, and I might see you at the next session. Thank you.